So, what drives economic growth? This is a really important question because if we can figure out the, the dials and the levers to pull, then we might be able to bring about higher and greater levels of economic growth, right? So there's a related question, though, that's going along with that these days, and that is, is growth dead? So to take a look at that, here's a chart that shows GDP growth, which is, which is gross domestic product. That's the final value of all the goods and services that we produce in the economy. And it's put on a year-over-year -year change basis. And those bars that are in there, those shaded areas, are recession periods. And so you can see when we have negative growth, downturns, recessions in the economy, they tend to go below that zero line there. And you can also see the Great Recession on the far right-hand side of the chart and how deep and long the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009 was. But take a look at this red line. It starts out and it shows us that over a 10-year period, growth averaged about 4% per year all the way up to the 73-75 OPEC oil-induced recession. And then it seems like it downshifted to about 3.25% per year for the next 30 years or so. And then we have the Great Recession, and it looks like growth has downshifted now to less than 2% per year. And this is crucial because we need that 4% growth. Uh, we'd like to return to that 4% growth. So again, what drives economic growth? Well, there's been a lot of smart people that have been thinking about this for years, and I've kind of taken their research and I've summarized it into four Ps. Okay, so if you can remember these. Is it proficiencies? Is it the skills and abilities and the knowledge of the workforce? Is it practices? The business practices that we put in place, supply chain management and uh, uh, lean technologies and this sort of thing. Is it perhaps the policies that drive economic growth? Things like free trade or minimum wage requirements or whatever the policies of the governments might be. Or is it providence, some kind of divine intervention, or maybe a country's ability to tap its natural resources and draw as much wealth out of those resources as possible? Well, going all the way back to Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations back and published in uh, 1776, he took a long, hard look at this, and you can uh, read all about it in his work, and summarized here, it shows you that it's the division of labor. It's this ability to specialize, to do what you do best and trade for the rest. And, and the role of money in fostering an efficient exchange system and having voluntary cooperation in markets and his idea of an invisible hand so that prices and quantities are determined exactly according to their um, needs in the economy. So throwing all this together into a model and I, you know, being in, um, in the research department, we like to put everything into a, represent it into a model. We have people, ideas, and things as our main inputs to our economy, and that'll help us generate this economic growth on the other side. But the X factor here in economic growth really is innovation. It comes down to ideas and what we can do in the innovation gym and elsewhere. So taking a look at a long term here, this shows that the U.S. in 200 years did a 5,000-year leap. If you look at the inset on the chart there in the year 1500, this plot of land that we now call the United States was the most impoverished place on the planet according to a measure of wealth that we look at called GDP per capita. But as you can see now, the U.S. has become the world's economic superpower and a lot of great notable outcomes here. We're the largest, and they have great universities and good idea generators and so forth. And Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter looked at these as waves of innovation. And these general purpose technologies like electricity or railways or electronics, things like that, propelled us forward. And I think now we're in this fifth wave of innovation, and it's probably close to a peak, actually. And this wave has been driven by the computer revolution the digital networks, the big data, the analytics that we can get out of, um, out of uh, businesses. And so speaking of businesses, why do they even exist? Have you thought about this question at all? I mean, 
look, businesses take inputs and they mix them all together and they come up with some kind of output. But sometimes we buy that output from a business and then there's other times that we go over on the input side and we organize all those things ourselves. So for example, sometimes you go to a restaurant and you buy a hamburger. Other times, you go to a store and you buy all the raw materials, you get a recipe book, or you get a recipe from mom, and you get a grill and you put together your own hamburger, right? So why is it that we go to the output side sometimes and the input side at other times? Well, Ronald Coase was the 1991 Nobel Prize winning economist, and he addressed this question in a paper that he did called The Nature of the Firm in 1937. And he says the answer to that question lies in the existence of transactions cost. So businesses, by putting their knowledge and resources and everything together, can lower prices, they can lower these transactions costs and add value overall to your experience, um, whether it be time, money, the experience, or whatever, however that is, uh, the value is added there. So about 10 years ago, I did some research on this myself. I called it, who supplied my cheese? And I was looking at the supply chain. You can see this cow is a very interesting cow. And the interesting thing about it that I was finding was the uh, information travels now in real time and we can put that to use. So in fact, when this guy takes a bite of this hamburger, there's an animal on the other end, and that animal is wondering, I'm next, you know, eat more chicken. So operations research, management science, analytics, kind of the stuff that we do in my department in, uh, in the Lyle School, is really the science of better, faster, cheaper. And you can see a lot of notable outcomes here for businesses that also had positive macroeconomic effects. And I just want to give you a couple of examples here. This chart shows better inventory control. That's uh, the inventory to shipments ratio. The average is about two for many, many years. And then after this fifth wave starts, we're able to hold lower levels of inventory. That means businesses don't have to tie up as much financial capital in their products and services before they go to market. Another thing we see is the reduced bullwhip effect. That is the information distortions that occur all along the supply chain and production growth volatility and sales growth volatility have now both been lowered and they're just about equal to each other, which again uh, leads to more efficiencies in their companies, better, faster, and cheaper. So I also wanted to look at this across countries. And so I did my own analysis using a neural network model. And this neural network model takes all of your data and kind of sifts through it and figures out who's alike and who's very dissimilar. And it put my nations into three um, general groupings here. So you can see the mostly open nations are highlighted in green here, and it's mainly your developed economies. The yellow nations, I've uh, termed them partially open. They tend to be more of your emerging economies. And then your red nations in there are the less developed economies or mostly closed nations. And then there's some gray areas up there. We couldn't get the data from the penguins and, and elsewhere to put some of this together for their countries. So what did we find in this neural network model? This is a measure of freedom. And the, the specific dimension I want you to focus in on is the one that says legal structure and property rights. And see how far out those mostly open nations are. I almost titled this talk, Don't Kill All the Lawyers Yet. Because we need the lawyers to help us establish those, those freedoms, the rule of law and the enforcement of contracts. Now that, that uh, dimension I plotted here along with a dimension for uh, corruption per perceptions. Corruption perceptions. And so you can see there's an inverse relationship there that the cleaner you are in your cor corruption perception is also the ones who have the highest legal structure. And not only that, I, I gave this chart kind of a spirograph look all 115 nations are plotted here, and I've got them grouped by, um, they're color-coded by what cluster they came in. On the far left, uh, those couple of dots over there are countries like Venezuela and Zimbabwe, and the middle blue is Greece 
and the U.S. is one of the big blues up in the, in the top. So it gives you an idea, and the size of that bubble is the size of the wealth creation. So back to our original question here, what drives economic growth? Well, I conclude in my research that it is innovative ideas and entrepreneurship. In fact, that's at the heart of economic growth. However, it takes more than just an idea. It has to be in the right environment. And you've got to have the rule of law in the enforcement of contracts. If you, have, if you don't have those things, a great idea is not going to go anywhere. And then built on top of this structure of contracts and um, legal protections is trustworthy financial markets. This is the place where the idea makers, the innovators, the scientists, the engineers, the artisans can all go and get funding for their great ideas and bring them to the marketplace like Adam Smith kind of envisioned more than a couple hundred years ago. And then beyond this, though, we have a few more things that are important. Openness or trade, um, creative human capital, and of course, being able to use the technology. In the future, it's not going to be uh, a race against the machines. It needs to be a race with the machines. And so with that, we can put this economic model together, <coughs> and it can, um, you can see it here is built on that foundation of the rule of law and the enforcement of, of, of property rights and um, even intellectual rights. And that'll bring about our final economic growth. So innovation matters now probably more than ever. And as far as a blueprint for growth, if you make me king and I have to tell you how to uh, grow your economy, I'd say if you're a developed economy, your focus needs to be on education, skills development, research and development, making sure your financial systems are safe and secure and competitive markets. Now, it also means that you've got to protect those legal protections, but that's not where the focus needs to be once they're put in place. For emerging economies, however, they need to cut the red tape, get the regulation out of the way. They need to promote trade, reduce corruption and crime, and then finally, less developed economies, their focus needs to be on giving them all the lawyers so they can develop these property rights and legal protections as well as reducing corruption and crime. So I'm often asked, is there going to be a sixth wave of innovation? I believe so. It could be what's called augmented intelligence, as my friend Manuj Seksima says. Or it could be machine learning or um, uh, uh, cognitive computing, the Internet of Things. It could be called the race with machines, as Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee talk about. So this quote by the great physicist Freeman Dyson says that we need to work with the machine, not against the machine. And 200 years ago, the Luddites, they tried to smash up all the machines and, uh, because they were a threat to their very livelihood. It's no different today. It's just that the machines are much smarter, smarter than they were back in the late 1700s. So what drives growth? I think it's these four Ps still. But I think we're going to have to reinvent ourselves. We're going to have to come up with new skills, new proficiencies. We're going to have to have new business models or new practices. We're going to have to have better policies that promote growth. And we probably also need to have more of a, a better respect for providence the divine creator. Thank you very much.